So, uh, welcome back uh, after this brief break. Um, so, I'm going to talk about what's inside the container, which, as was pointed out, wasn't the advertised talk uh, that Jason couldn't, uh, sorry, Justin couldn't make it over in time. Uh, so, I'm from Puppet, rather than working for Docker, I've got a Moby t shirt. Uh, I'm Gareth Rushgrove, uh, Gareth R, pretty much everywhere on the internet at this point. Uh, I build things and wander around. Uh, Formerly, I'm a principal software engineer at Puppet. So, Puppet basically tools for automating infrastructure, um, which includes containers, and I'll talk about a bit about that, but I'm not going to talk about too much Puppet. <laughs> uh, so, what's all this about? Um, following a sort of fairly classic talk outline, there'll be some research, there'll be some tools, there'll be some live demos. Um, uh, thank you for letting me go second, because the live demos weren't working until. I ported a script from Bash to PowerShell. Uh, uh, literally about two minutes ago, so thank you very much. Um, uh, the talk was put together in five hours, so I'll let myself some slack. So, research is into sort of container usage. Um, uh, it's not bang up today, it's a few months old at this point, but I think it's super interesting and still relevant. Uh, I will update it, I promise. Uh, was anyone at Configuration Management Camp this year in Belgium? One hand. Did you see me talk? Nope. Excellent. No one has seen me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not at all the same talk. It has some of the same numbers for the first 10 minutes. Um, it moves on from that talk, really, with more answers. A lot of that talk, if people are interested in this video and everything else, uh, was all basically sort of like problem. This is a bit of problem and like, more solution stuff. Um, so, some background. Uh, as I said, there is talk, it's called What's Inside That Container, uh, which is similar to this. Please have a look at this video. Uh, there was some companies from the new stack uh, who got quite excited and did an interview uh, with that. Uh, as I said, kind of this data is a little bit out of date, but I'm, I, like, I, sh I will be running the numbers, but it's not that out of date. So, um, turns out there's actually lots of easily accessible data about like actually how people what are people doing with containers um, any sort of data source is going to have some bias like it's not necessarily going to be representative of exactly what you're doing in your organization with containers today or tomorrow but the scale of the data at least makes it interesting um, so I don't know if people know about like, the so Docker, Docker Home has a really excellent API. Um, you can get, you can use curl to get all sorts of stuff. I'm a massive fan of JQ, as you will find out by the end of this talk. Um, so actually, grabbing like the download count for any arbitrary image is as simple as just send an entity request and pass out pull count from, J from JSON. So what, what does that tell us? Well, you end up with data like this, um, extra data as well. Um, these are the uh, this is a sample of basically the most popular images downloaded from Hub. Um, this is what, as a community of Docker users, we've been up to. Uh, so we've been pulling a lot of Ubuntu. <coughs> um, uh, there's also interesting bits around. Well, uh, it's Alpine's uh, pretty popular, but like that. Some of that will definitely be the official images, and we. But what, you're, what you see is that these are a lot of operating systems. There aren't containers about in, uh, individual process and applications. We'll come back to that. Because that's an awful lot of large file systems. But there are other images other than the operating system ones. There's Node, there's PHP, there's MySQL, there's Nginx, there's Elasticsearch. There's the application one. Well, there we're getting away from this operating system model of bringing containers, right? Well, actually, no, because these are all based on an operating system image. They would have based on one of the other ones from before. So the Node one, which is super popular, the Java one, which is super popular, they're based on the Debian image. So anyone pulling those is getting is pulling down Debian ones. There's been some talk of like the official images moving to Alpine. There are, there are lots of tags with Alpine for a lot of them, but they're not still the default latest in most cases. Um, quick and scientific poll. Uh, this is only 300 people, which is quite good. Um, 
and it works for this as well. Like, what base images are you using? And so there's a few people who are cool using Scratch. Um, probably Go programmers. Uh, mainly they're only going to maybe the of Fedora. That sort of split is interesting. Um, mainly Alpine Busy Docs, sort of like smaller, like <coughs> sort of more, like, well, really just smaller distros. Um, but the gap between like basically everyone and a few people, I think, is the main topic way of that. Um, what are people using here out of those? So, who's mainly using scratch images? <laughs> See, there's always a hipster. <laughs> <laughs> but who's mainly oh, using sort of uh, Debian and or Ubuntu images? No. <laughs> who's mainly using Fedora and I like, mainly gives you a lot of wiggle room. Um, and who's mainly using Alpine BusyBox? That would like caveat. I like we did that very quickly. I'd say that was about the same, like proportions. There was like a few. There were the majority. There were a bunch of hands um, clustered together as well. I'm going to guess their colleagues. I'm going to guess they work for large companies. Um, and then like not as many as the two, but a bunch of hands. So I, I still think this is valid. I still think this is probably roughly what people are doing in most places. Um, more data from different sources, because you can't have too many different places. Uh, this was pulled from GitHub. Um, GitHub uh, basically, all of the open source content on GitHub is available in BigQuery, Google's um, big public data set service. Um, and you can query it, and it's amazing. Uh, <laughs> I, I do a number, I spend an enormous amount of time and pocket money on Google BigQuery and GitHub. It's just so good. Uh, so this is saying, BigQuery, give me all of the Docker files, or rather all of the files called Docker file on GitHub that are public and open source. Um, um, someone did it first, and I think they kind of changed it. Uh, I, I think it's Gao, I can't remember his name, but you should tell it's linked to him in the slides. Um, so I can't claim all the credit for this. But you see actually similar things here. Um, interestingly, you see a lot less Alpine in people's actually the images that appear to like the Docker files they're creating that they're building than the ones being downloaded. That's sort of interesting. Um, but otherwise, you, again, you see Ubuntu and Debian making up a big chunk. Um, so the end sort of adjusted percentage is really around. You've got things like Node. You've got things like Python in the sort of top. This is just the top stack. But again, sort of similarly, similarly, plays out similarly. You, you have got a bunch of Fedora, you've got probably a bit more Alpine and BusyBox. Um, you've got a, a, just this massive chunk of, of Debian derivatives. Um, and you have got a few people doing Scratch. So it's like, interesting that you get like, those three data sets sort of point pretty much the same sort of picture. Um, gives me a bit of confidence to mix broad statements like this. But the majority of people using Docker are using images containing an entire operating system file system. Uh, I don't think that's changing anywhere near as quickly as some people on the internet would so maybe lead you to believe. Uh, and I think that's interesting. Uh, it's also a <laughs> good friend. Yeah. Uh, yes, this is awful and terrifying. Uh, so like, yes, uh, like, People will probably do this, and it's also terrifying. Um, I, I sort of disagree. I think you can have a sort of. I, I don't think that's the same as saying and stop doing it. Like I think it's more nuanced than that. And we'll come on to some of that. Um, more sort of like statements presented as facts. Uh, scratch other approaches like Nix. There's a whole. There's a bunch of others as well now. Um, appear to occupy a small niche. Like it will be interesting over time to see whether that changes. But that's the sort of rebuild the world sort of approach. Um, move to brand new like primary languages. Move to brand new uh, sort of like build systems. Often move to brand new companies with no like previous technology. Um, Alpine usage, some of the small distros seem to have mainly like it's actually with sort of Docker's official backing like. Centered on Alpine, like there, were, there are a whole bunch of them. Alpine seems to get the lion's share of interest in like container space today. 
it's growing totally, and um, it's growing much more rapidly than the others, but from a very small base. Um, it's very much short of like the Debian derivatives. So, I want it's like there's some numbers, there's some tables, there's some graphs. Uh, what, why did this matter? Um, Lots of people start with size. Oh, it matters because things are bigger. Uh, it sort of does, but not that much. Um, if, it, if size mattered as much as some people get cross about, um, we would not see people doing what they're doing. Because like, the size differences are huge. Um, so, like outlines a few meg, and you end up with others that are hundreds. These numbers will have changed a little bit. I, I know for a fact that the, Alpine, the Amazon Linux one is much, much smaller now, for example. Most of the, because of the sort of meme of size, most of the distro met the sort of uh, vendors got into a bit of a how can we make it smaller. Uh, irrespective of then a number of people then have things back to them. Uh, that number became something that people were rating themselves against. Probably good, but not actually, I, I would argue, super, super meaningful. And it's not like leading people to, like on mass, I think simply go, oh, size is the most important thing, I'm going to use the smallest thing I can do. I think there are way more interesting and terrible, terrifying <laughs> reasons. Um, so, count the files on the images. Um, how many files do you think are on a Ubuntu latest? Carry out things here. On the <laughs> Half a million, anyone else? Another thousand. No, the, uh, yeah, the Docker image. Yeah. 100k. 100k. Uh, okay. um, another question, like, how many software packages? Like, look, so the of files are sort of wild. But yeah, some of them might be big, some of them might be small. They might all be from the same person, they're all managed by the same group. That's, like, that sort of starts getting into counting lines of code. And, but like, how many software packages? How many different discrete bits of software are on there? It's not getting interesting. About a hundred. About a hundred? <laughs> I, won't, I won't do too much. Um, do you do things like this? So, people got a bit carried away with the like millions of them. <laughs> but, still, that are like, I, and some of this is down to the images being stripped down, but you're still talking about a, a large enough number that like, you and your colleagues are totally not going to know what they all are. Um, even down to oh, software packages, and, th and this is one of the sort of probably the most interesting outline drop. It, and because like, you need the kernel, and you need like sort of probably some new kernels. Um, you end up with an awful lot of software in these containers, and this is all software you're running. If you're running containers today, and you're running any of these images today, this is all bits on disk. Might not be resident in memory, might not be actually like processors running, but it's all there. And we saw with things like some of the uh, bash exploits and some of the OpenSSL exploits, even if you're not using it, it can still totally get you. Um, so, I, I, a question I ask a whole bunch of people um, is can you tell the older versions of OpenSSL you have in production right now? Go! I'll be right here. Uh, um, yeah, I know, the, the honest answer. For most org for, well, for for most organisations is no, and sometimes because the cost of doing so doesn't outweigh the risk. For some of you, for some organisations, um, I know like, certainly people are working in heavy regulated environments. I did a bunch of work before I was a puppet for the UK, for the UK government. There are areas where not being able to answer this is like a serious problem. There are others where it's a criminal offence. There are others where the fine uh, would buy you a nice chunk of Amsterdam. There are like, being able to answer this question London. at any given time, and uh, London's getting cheaper, <laughs> uh, like is important. And we like for containers to sort of take up in some of those areas, we need to be able to have good answers to questions like this. Um, Picking on that one because I think it's always, it's always relevant, but there are lots of other questions. It's like, because sometimes it's the innocuous bit of software that causes you problems. At some point, you are going to have some software. Um, like knowing what it is, having a good inventory of it is very important, especially in an environment that's getting increasingly mixed. Um, so, I did mention some tools. I'll like, talk through some bits and pieces. Because there's, there's sort of two approaches to solving this problem. 
And I think some of what Justin was actually going to be talking about was closer to this. Uh, the world is terrible, and like there's sort of a rebuild everything approach. And um, this is really appealing because I think we have a much better idea of the problem space, and um, not just from a container standpoint, but from an infrastructure standpoint. But so starting again is super appealing. Um, and you see tools like I mean, uh, Linux Kit, I think is super interesting. There's a, like you can you can envisage very very modern infrastructure built on actually new principles. I mean, like we've seen the evolution of immutable infrastructure as a concept. I think we're starting to see like tooling emerge, and we'll start seeing systems just being built like that. Um, and that's sort of option one, and that's good. Like so, the, the caveat is the real world is probably messier and takes a lot longer than like most people realise to sort of like catch up with. I know what the right answer is. Uh, like history sort of says, most of those things take a while to propagate. Um, it's definitely lossy, even if we genuinely do know what the right answer is. I think a lot of tooling focuses on an attempt to make a, a truly generational shift. I think there's quite a lot of space for sort of bits and pieces that help people with the problem of like they have these th they have these things today. I don't take any of this as oh no we need to not have containers until a lot of these problems are fixed. That's not how the world works either. Um, Technology serves like business opportunities and business like goals and needs. Um, and having technology that allows you to move faster um, is a business imperative in nearly every organisation that I'm aware of. Um, having technology that allows you to do that is important. Can you make it safer than it would be by default? If you can, that I think there's incremental value there. And a lot of that ends up being messier. Uh, quite a like messy problem. Can I, um, can I comment on that? Uh, going faster and, and changing to other technologies means you have to migrate. And migrations are, as we all know, pain in the ass. Yep. It takes some time. So, yes, you go faster, but it takes more time to get there. Yep. I think there's, so, some of that is about how organizations move through different generations. And uh, I find that like most sort of like large organizations at a certain point are running all the software they've ever run. Um, like it, it decreases. Like, I mo uh, and most organisations I would I'm generalising, but are probably running less stuff on their mainframes than they used to be. But they're still running, and they're probably still running the core bits. <coughs> they might and uh, organisations that have that have sort of started adopting containers in anger, and they've been going at it for a little while, are probably running a little bit less today on their Java sort of middleware type stacks than maybe they were a few, a few years ago, but there's still a lot of it, and there's still a lion's share of the sort of workloads. Um, I think like how technology moves in organizations is super interesting. I can come in from, from the startup, which only had half a year started, and no customers before, and, and we were already migrating to new technologies. Yep. We made mistakes, we, we uh, had, you know, forced upon some technologies and then we migrated away from them. Yeah. I, I think a, a six good... Six months, yes? Six yeah. months old company. I think a, a good rule of thumb is make it easy to change technologies. So that's much easier said than done. And I think that's a more recent realisation. So, uh, talk about a few of the tools that are sort of interesting, I think, here. Um, uh, Scott here from Red Hat, I think it's sort of neat. Um, so, I don't know if people... Have anyone seen it here? Um, excellent. Like bring new things. Basically, obviously, like, whether you have, whether you're using Hub or whether you're using an internal repository using all the, the uh, sort of the API from Hub, Scopio allows you to query the registry data without downloading the image. So a, that's faster. Um, b, you're not downloading something before like knowing something about it. Um, and again, so command line tool, in fact. Gives you a bunch of uh, JSON data. Um, there's a whole bunch of other stuff as well, just like from the repository. Uh, I like tools like this that sort of, I like tools that give you data, um, as I think all of the ones I'm talking about do. Uh, partly because you can chain them together, you can, you, like, these are not solutions, they're building blocks. And I think where we are with a bunch of these problems today is like we, we started to have a number of building blocks, more so than six months ago when I 
gave the original talk about, like more diving down into the research thing. But having, like, knowing something about something in a repository uh, doesn't tell you anything about the actual, what's inside that image. Um, it also doesn't tell you anything about that running container. So you, at this moment, you might already have a load of containers running. Well, what's inside those? Um, so, caveat, this is something I worked on. Uh, it's open source, it's free on the internet. You can uh, download it. Um, I don't feel too proud about talking about it. Uh, but Lumigon is basically a, like one of those sort of small tools designed to like, help you analyze <coughs> containers at runtime. Just some other bits pieces as well, and I'll show some demos. Um, but, for example, Coming back to that open SSL question, or like, well, what's it, what, what versions of software are inside that container? Um, Lumigon, basically, Lumigon scan, will uh, hit the Docker API, hit the Docker socket, launch a bunch of containers, do it, analyze containers in, from a number of different angles. You can pull some information from the Docker API from the outside. Um, we uh, enter this namespace and, like, via the PID and execute some commands in the context of containers to pull other information out. We get some bits from the file system. Um, it's trying to say there are a number of different ways you might analyze things. Here is a framework to do all of them and present it in a, a, a standardized way. So you get a lot of data. Uh, you can make it pretty rigid, obviously. Uh, you can, but there's loads of stuff in here. Um, obviously, that's fairly unintelligible. I, said, I like tools that give you data, but they're not they allow you to build your own user interfaces more than presenting them. Um, in that big blob of JSON, uh, there's a lot of packages from different package managers. Uh, definitely the intention is to add more. Um, uh, there's a bunch of host information, so like the, the, the distro, of the, the uh, like version of that uh, information. If people are familiar with Puppet or configuration management tools, you start seeing parallels between things like Factor and Ohai from Chef the things here, you start seeing parallels between like all the package resources in the sort of config management tools. What we're saying is here is an inventory tool for containers that gives you all that information and we'll go. Um, we also pull information from things like the Docker API so you get some of the same uh, like Docker inspect but on steroids. Docker inspect plus things that are inside that the API can't know. Um, and you can extend it with your own capabilities but at the moment it's not a sort of true plugin model. Um, so. So we have a load of data, like a big blob of data about every single container you have been running now. Like you've run Docker, you've got a little scan, it's gone out and scanned everything. Um, what can we do? Uh, well, and certainly I find myself with the sort of the Docker command line tools often doing like sort of Docker PS, um, dash AQ, uh, and maybe filtering for a specific tag, or maybe all of them, maybe killing everything. Um, with Lumigon sort of in there, instead of just relying on metadata, you can rely on content as well. Obviously, you pay a, it's slightly slower. You could you could rebuild Docker the sort that sort of Docker no sort of Docker ASQ like tag type pipeline with Lumigon. It would be slightly slower, but you can't do this with like big, like the, with sort of just the standard Docker tools. Because you wouldn't know whether something was running like that operating system family. A, you need to normalize that. B, the meta you, like, you can't just rely on metadata unless you have trusted metadata. Um, so we can do all sorts of things there. Uh, I said I love JQ. Um, I think the intention with Lumigon and why I'm talking about here is something sort of it's a low level tool um, for you to build higher level ones on top. Um, prototyping those with JQ is sort of really interesting. Um, here is a, 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 a good, horrible Jacob query. Um, that will tell you the version of Bash in all of your containers. Um, so <laughs> we're doing, we're being a bit clever. We're saying, like, well, print the name, like iterate through all our containers, print the name, uh, and print the uh, Bash version for the package and the Bash version from the RPM. <laughs> like, thing. so the. Query is a bit horrible, but the output is really super interesting. Like, here are all the bash versions for all my containers. Think how you might do that otherwise. 
and think what you might do with this data. Like, the security person runs in screaming and goes, ah, like, what, 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 are, what versions of OpenSL are we running on all our containers? Here's the answer. Um, you can imagine a high-level tool rather than like, the fact that it's actually sort of hidden here. Like, wrap that in a PowerShell script, wrap that in a Bash script, wrap, wrap that in your favorite language of choice. Getting fancier. Um, so, there we had a list of packages and versions. But what if you don't have the security person running into your room? What if you want to tell them it's already fixed when they come in, or you don't have much respect for them and they don't, you don't think they'll tell you it, that something's broken? Uh, this is a bit of a hack. It only really works with the Debian data source, but that's only because I spent a bit of time on it rather than lots of time. Um, basically, it's all called find CVE. It has a bunch of passing options. Basically, you send it a list of packages, which could come from anywhere. It knows certain formats, and one of the formats it knows is Lumigon. So we can scan, we can do a Lumigon scan, and we can pipe it through to find CVE, and we end up with output like that. Um, and again, like, I think like that, that's doing it at runtime. This is not an image that was scanned at one point that didn't have anything. Um, this is giving you a nice, you can, this is giving you a nice button output. You can ask for JSON and you could build unit testing tools on top of it. You can see how you could start. I like composable things. So um, coming back to the repository, though, because one of the downsides with Lumigon is well, it needs that running container. It's good if you have running containers, uh, less otherwise. Uh, Scorpio is, is super useful because it's just so fast you hit, the repo you hit a repository and get some data back. Um, Manifesto is a tool from uh, Fenn and uh, Liz at Aqua Security um, around basically storing and query metadata um, alongside your images on a repository. I think it just works with Hub at the moment, but it will work with others. Um, so yeah, storing query metadata about Docker images. So you end up sort of with put and get basically. Manifesto put your image. Uh, that's an arbitrary name, and that's some JSON content that I'm going to put up there. Could be anything, could be any arbitrary content. Manifesto is totally opaque to what it's doing. It just allows you to store it and get it back. And anyone else can get it back for a public image because it's a public repository. Um, so scan image bash script that uses Lumigon under the hood to get the Lumigon output and manifesto put to store it alongside it. Um, for all of the official puppet images, we actually do this automatically. So as part of the build process, whenever they're pushed to Hub, they get new Lumigon data attached to them. What that means is anyone who has the manifesto tools can actually do manifesto get. <coughs> well, actually, you can list what type of metadata, like metadata is attached to images, and it's all versioned. It's also all uh, tied in with the hash system around the Docker so the, the Docker hub, so there's a bunch of stuff there. And you can get it, so we, I'm just going the first bits here, but you can see this is the Lumigon data that I showed earlier, slightly prettier printed. Um, so for any of the images on hub that, I say, why well, I don't think anyone could do this, um, anyone from outside, without downloading them, can ask questions like, because remember this is Lumigon data, so you could pass it through JQ, you could pass it into another tool that you could do whatever you want with it. You could pass it through FindTV. So the whole bunch of uh, sort of more examples of doing Lumion stuff with Manifesto on there. Um, I'm going to do some live demos, hopefully I have some time. Um, so. so I've got in a whole bunch of different containers running uh, basically different operating system sort of bases and different random containers, uh, just so I've got some data to play with. Um, so yeah, let's... So, uh, Lumigon's uh, packaged as a... I'll leave it on. Lumigon's packaged as a Docker container, so you can just run it. You get access to the Docker API. Um, you could build your own binary and reaction them at some point. Um, but you can sort of alias all of that away uh, if you choose. Uh, we're doing scan, we're going to point it at one of our containers, which is the 
Lumigon, Test, Debian, Stretch. Well, uh, obviously these names mean that I know what they are, but they could be anything. Uh, if I just ran scan, it would scan all of the containers on the host. Um, we'll probably have something in between those at some point as well. Uh, and you can sort of see there's a whole bunch of data. So you can see it. There's a hash of uh, packages and versions. There's information about, like, actually about the API. So we've got some data there. Uh, we've got labels. Uh, there's a bunch of other things. There's some bits of the new version as well I haven't got. Um, I mentioned find CV as being interesting. So all that's doing is taking that hash of packages. Um, I've, I've run it previously, so it downloaded the Debian uh, SC CVE data. Um, if I, I think there'll be a file on disk, I'm not going to open it because it's huge. Uh, Debian.json. If I hadn't, if that wasn't there, it would just download it. Uh, it's fairly naive. Um, but yeah, that isn't listing all the packages. It's listing ones where it found current CVEs. And it's giving you some sort of actual information. <coughs> some of these are just unimportant. Uh, Bash has a vulnerability, but hey, like it's a temp temporary one and it's unimportant. Who cares? On the other hand, Util Linux appears to have a high severity CVE. Um, maybe that's not affecting me. Maybe that's not affecting containers. But like, I'm totally like based on this information, I am totally going to go look up at that, that CVE and find out what it is. So making that, and you can imagine again, I'm making this a bit more optimal, making this part of your build tool chain, making this part of a video testing. Uh, and there's some examples of using uh, Lumigon in the testing setup in the repo as well. I don't think I've got quite enough time to go over them here. How real time is this CV? Uh, so the, uh, well, the find CV tool is a, is a bit of a hack, uh, but how that's working, it only works on Debian bits. It is downloading the the, the data produced, the published by the Debian project for CVEs. So it's as up to date as that data. Um, if you were to do it with, uh, like with uh, Red Hat, if I go this to there, um, Red Hat produced a really good API. This is the security data API with all the information. Um, it's much harder for something like like some of the distros. Uh, Alpine have a project. It's a Git repository, and it's. There's, it's, I don't know questions over how updated it is, but I know they're super interested in making that better. Um, Claire does a, like Claire the scaling tool, and in particular, actually, Docker Trusted Registry does a fantastic job of this at build time. But there's that question of if you have containers still running that were built through those processes, like how is it updated? So it's another way of doing it. And it's handy when you just want to pick on that container and find out information. So. Something else was, um, you might be interested in images rather than containers. Um, and scan image uh, is basically just a script around Lumigon um, that, I mean, it's, it's, let's just go have a look at it. Uh, all it's doing is, run, is basically running that image. <coughs> You probably want to do that in some sort of sandbox, ideally, um, and running moving on against it and then killing it and getting some data. So, and again, because that's just outputting this standardized format, of, so there's a schema as well for that, we can do, So, who's, who's got an image on Hub that they fancy scanning with this? <laughs> <laughs> or, or any suggest oh, suggestions for images? Redis. Redis. It's not, I, it, as a tool, it's not perfect. There are, there are certainly images where it won't quite do, like, it won't get all of the information. Hopefully, it won't flow. Um, well, it, 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 whether it's ever missed or not, it should still pull. Uh, I mean, it's not just the I mean, it's just the fine CV hack tool. Just spot step in. Um, uh, Lumigon itself will get up, collect information about anything it can get its hands on. Um, so uh, the Redis one is based on Debian. Uh, it does have a bunch of packages. Um, yeah, let's let's find out. Not 
any labels on the uh, this one. Show them more labels. I'm a fan of labels and metadata. Uh, there you go. So, so I, 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 nice thing there. I know the Redis is one of the supported ones. Uh, if something came up there, like I, I'd sort of question my tool probably more than the tool. But the fact it doesn't is sort of a good sign that like Doctor's Registry is, is doing its job. Um, there are all sorts of other things you can do. Predominantly by knowing ourselves by chaining things together. Um, the sort of intention here is low-level components. Um, that you can build on. So, it's all summarizing and not collecting thoughts really. And for me, like, container adoption needs a gentle slope, not a based with a parachute map experiment. Um, sometimes this is the right answer. Um, and in some organizations, both will be the right answer. But I don't think this is the only right answer. Um, I think having tools that deal with the world as we find it is really important and, in, and actually much more interesting than most people think. Um, I think they're also more relevant to more people um, in the real world than the internet probably thinks. Uh, the real world is messier than the sort of cloud native ideal, and that's not picking on this. I like this is this is sort of what I believe in. The, like the future that is described and described is definitely like where we want to be. But getting there is the hard bit, not knowing where we're going. Um, we, um, we need to consider the situation where we are running unknown artifacts. People are horrified that, but that's the reality. Um, and I think too often people think, well, no, because I have a process which will prevent this ever happening. We ignore tools where, actually, that's the reality in most places. Are you, I'm like, it's like the argument of, are you rebuilding every single software package you're running? Like prior to connect, are you rebuilding every single software package? Are you hosting every package in an internal repository? The answer to some organizations is yes, from source. We have a trusted like, way of getting the source code from some upstream, and we build it on securely held machines with like, known versions of compilers. Like, and the answer is, for most people, no. Like, I download something on the internet and run it. Um, some of those things have good security built in, some of them don't. People are terrible. Um, <laughs> Having tools that have, like deal with that reality at the same time as trying to remove that reality, I think is important. Uh, I'm obsessed with small composable tools that sort of like you can build higher level tools together. I don't think we have answers here. I, I've shown a few tools that I think are interesting. There are others. Um, I would like to see more because I think the higher level, the sort of the actual answers come from small bits joined up and then probably being replaced by something that does the thing that was valuable well. Can we not make these scans compulsory before we pull these images and you know, start using them? Yes, totally. And then so, uh, introducing these types of tools into your build process is totally something that you should do. Um, there's a few examples in the, the Lumigon project GitHub repository has like an examples folder. Um, uh, one of the demos I didn't show because it's a bit more involved is uh, basically writing assertions against the data. Um, and you can do that for security purposes or any purpose you want. You have some, you have have this data. You can make assertions about it in your pipelines. <coughs> the nice thing there is that, from a, a sort of compliance, from a standards point of view, someone can give you a test suite that your like your container has to pass, and um, that gets interesting with me. Uh, I in sorry, really. I like. I hardly recommend finding out what's inside your container. Um, or at least thinking about what could be inside your containers that would cause you real problems. Because I think that then is a road towards going, oh, actually, yeah, what, what tools do I need to address those problems? Plus, the more people think about the problem, the more worried people get. And the more I think we have a conversation about like, what does the real world look like. Thank you. Hopefully that was of interest and useful. Any, any questions briefly, I guess? We've got time? Looks like it. Yeah, any questions? Yeah. And there was one thing I thought. So you had these tools uh, that can query the packages, the, the, the containers about what software versions are in there. Uh, that's maybe also a security thing, right? 
Well, so I think there are there are lots of there are lots of reasons why you might want that data, and I think it it gets into sort of different organisations. For some people, it's just knowledge. For like, I want to know the dependencies of what my software is running on, just from a oh, I know the software I have, and this is truer of I guess all the software. Like, it probably only works with certain versions of certain things. And those things are not documented because that's just what was running. And we don't change the operating system underneath things because like things break and we stop doing that. So for, for that sort of idea of like porting like sort of that type of application to containers, knowing exactly what's in those containers, knowing the package versions is really important from a just like, an interop perspective, a does it run perspective? Is it like have we changed the software by changing one of its underlying dependencies? Um, I think there's also a strong security angle where I think like, just as a use case, that one's really strong for like I, a lot of organizations that sort of get into sort of CMDB configuration management database type stuff do so partly because that data is very relevant to an auditing situation or a true security situation as well. Yeah. Yeah. Do not stop your head. Um, so if you pull a bunch of layers, typically uh, does Canonical do a good job of patching that fairly regularly and making sure that there aren't vulnerabilities, or is it kind of a mixed bag? Uh, yes, I think I'm so with the efficient so I'm, I obviously I don't there's anyone from Docker here today. If Justin was here, he'd have the agreement from Google. But the, for the official images, um, they all go through uh, Docker Trusted Registries <laughs> scanning. Yeah. Um, and there is a like for the maintainers of those, there is a like you will get told by our software that like, there is an issue uh, and there is an SLA for fixing them. Um, as a follow-up question, do you know uh, many companies or processes that you know that, for example, uh, let's say you don't have new code in your container, but there's a new image, and so that will automatically get rebuilt and then pushed up to your, to your cluster? Yeah, and so a lot of the sort of deployment, I, I, a lot of people write that themselves, I think, okay. frankly. Um, I, there are a few sort of sort of bigger high level framework type things that sort of I've got on the Netflix one what it's called. Um, but I think we'll see more th things like that industrialized and, and built into a, like initially the sort of commercial things but also then other tools. But yeah, I, I don't I think in a lot of the tooling around containers, that's again a probably a different example of we sort of know what the answer is. But is there an industrialized answer to that answer, that, that question today? No, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's yeah. more that the trigger being not that you updated your application, but the upstream image was right. updated. Uh, um, it's like, it, and it depends on also if you build it in the right way, it won't matter as much. If you're not deploying that often, maybe you're reporting like something like legacy and you're not touching it. It would make sense to have it the opposite. So. Oh, right. That's interesting, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, that's obviously going to depend on how your build is configured. Right? Right, yeah. And I think that how your build is configured is invariably today uh, somewhat hand rolled a lot of stuff. Um, I, I think over time that will, will end up with like, that was crazy and expensive, and like, those people left and it's all terrible. Uh, and we'll end up with more industrials, like, sort of build solutions. But like yeah. right now, Docker Hub, for example, doesn't really have a uh, proper impact mechanism for all these certain things. You can notify its own builds, but you can't notify it externally. Or the, there is a web hook, but like you can't programmatically install it after it or whatever. You all, and there are lots of bits to do it yourself, and lots, and yeah. lots of people doing it. I, yeah, there's not a part of the box. Um, gentleman behind? Uh, oh, yeah, I have a question. Like, uh, you are checking only the packages name with your CV dictionary or whatever, or are you actually extracting the packages and also looking through? Was it maybe possible that package is like tampered? So the name. Yeah, name? Like, and the the find CV sort of example is definitely a more of a proof of concept. Um, all it's doing is saying like the. And it comes from the canonical source, so you, there is some like validity there. Um, you can get that data through quite trusted means that everybody is pretty good at that. Um, the, what you're trusting there is both 
those packages haven't been tam tampered with, and the tool extracting the name version information hasn't been tampered with and is correct. So there are assumptions there. Um, caveat, software bugs, assuming Louis doesn't have a software bug, then like, how you get the tool is important. Um, Docker Hub is actually a pretty good distribution mechanism for that, um, with some of the trusted registry stuff. Um, the, the software, the software like, has this package been tampered with? Um, the package managers are actually quite good at that. Um, so, I, one of the things that we talked about exposing in Lumion separately, rather, like, rather than just do that, is you can ask the package manager, has, any, like, has there been any changes to any files from any of the packages that you have installed? Um, the package has all of that information. Again, like caveat, you need to trust the tool that's doing that, but that's where, again, like, you build these soft provenance streams. Like, do you trust the Debian package that came down? Do you know that there are no other layers between that and like the application? Do you like you build out all this sort of trust? So it's it's totally possible to do that if you're like inclined. And um, the stuff I've shown doesn't do that, but it's mainly just because it's uh, like a proof of concept more than anything else. And there, there is no way of actually getting the package files, like, getting the files out so that you can do uh, more on that and it's just uh, you, so you, you, know, you, could, you could certainly go further and actually uh, extract the packages out, out yourself. Um, I think the reality is you'd what you get into there is more the sort of binary scanning type approach. That's something like Docker uh, just registry does. Um, that like and what like they're doing much more than just uh, comparison of data. They're doing. Uh, like basically malware signature detection. And um, so the idea of, r of running those file systems through malware scanning detection is also something that's a good idea. It's slightly different to the, like, it gets more into the security side of the, like, yeah. tangent rather than the data side of stuff that I was talking about. But like, yeah, you, you can do all these things. The tools exist. We can chain them all together. Um, at some point in the future, you'll be like, oh, I built a really bad version of that, and now there's an industrialized version. But having it would still be really cool today. Yeah, good idea. Oh. Uh, one more question? Kind of as a follow-up. Um, if you have like a, a lot of bigger companies will prefer not to use something like uh, the public Docker registry for their images, they'll want to run something internally. Uh, is there a tool that uh, exists that you can run that like on-premise so that does scanning like this? Uh, so I think there are a few folks doing that. I mean, like, by a few, I mean a lot of people doing like security containers things. Okay. Uh, I think if you do a search for like Docker security scanning, you will probably be followed around by in, by internet ads for that for a while. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I'm certainly like I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to name companies I've run. There's actually some of them are bad, really good, but I haven't used any of them in anger, so I'm, I don't want to. Lead. But yeah, I, I would ask other people because there's probably a bunch of experience. Um, Nexus Lifecycle yeah, does it. There's uh, quite a lot. Not for uh, probably the Docker images, but they want to introduce the Docker scanning. Okay. But they are good at uh, open source components in third party technology. Okay, so yeah, I'll, I'll stick around anyway for a while and if anyone's got any more questions, come find me. But yeah, hopefully that was interesting and useful. Yeah.